Hello everyone. We are starting late because of technical difficulties. Um, plus, I'm always late. <laughs> I even got a shirt at Comic-Con for being late. So you can look forward to that. Or maybe not. This week's live stream... Oh, I need to turn on the comments. Let's see. Hi, Shane. How are you? I got one person on the stream. <laughs> See what happens when you don't start on time? People don't want to show up anymore. Hi, James. Nasty Nemo. Great name. Hi, Reef and Dive. So, let's see what we got here. Check. Lower. While we're getting started, thought I'd show you guys the new light I installed last night over the refugium. It's not turned on right now, but it's an XHO from Reef Bright. It's this guy right here. And it's hanging on fishing line, because that is my preference for hanging lights. It's inexpensive, uh, a big spool lasts you the rest of your life. And I can elevate that light if I want by pulling on the string and moving it to a new location. Let's do that for you. Well, in theory, this would work. If I could get this thing to hook into the hole. All right, well, anyway, that is slightly higher. Screen is black. Hmm. Well, let me come back. How about now? Um, the topic this week is about Macna and why you should go. And I have gone to every single Macna since 2002. So what is that, 17 times? Uh, this will be my 18th time because 2002 I actually went. Um, I think I've got the math right on that. This is the 31st Macna in uh, history. <laughs> uh, they started way back whenever that was, 78? Uh, and it's taking place in Orlando, Florida this year, actually at the Walt Disney Resort. I got this thing on here for you. So here is the official website, which is macnaconference.com. And it's taking place August 30th through September 1st, Orlando, Florida, at the Walt Disney and Dolphin Resort. And you guys, I just saw this today, which is really good news, because a lot of people pay a lot of money to go to Macna. If you consider what it costs for the flight, if you consider what it costs for the... Um, <laughs> I just noticed my picture-in-picture picture is like the wrong camera. How do I switch that? Well, anyway, um, I'll fix that in a minute. Or maybe I can see if this works. Two, three, no. Nope, nothing's working. Um, what was I saying? Lost my track, my train of thought. Oh, so I just saw today that the trip going there, you know, obviously there's a flight or you have to drive or you have to rent a car. It's gonna cost you so much money. But I found out for the locals, those of you guys near Orlando, Florida, which is just a few hours drive for many of you or less, you could go ahead and you could come to our uh, event for only 20 bucks for the day. Sorry, I'm having technical difficulties, of course. Let's try this, all right, all right. Um, so for 20 bucks, you can get in all day. And then the parking is $10. So for 30 bucks, basically, you can attend a conference all day long and see over 150 vendors. I don't know if that'll get you into any talks. It's possible, but I'm not positive about that. Um, that's part of the, that is actually the main draw of Macna. I mean, it's nice to go to vendors. I, I love it. I like to see the latest technology, ask questions about gear. But my, you know, the part that educates are the speakers. And, you know, you guys tune in for a live stream every week. Well, the ultimate live stream would be to go to Macna and sit there for 45 minutes and hear that live stream in person and then, you know, ask questions and answers. And then another one starts now, you know, 15 minutes later and you just get this for three days long. So it's sort of like 72 hours of live stream with every topic you can imagine. 
One of the biggest topics that caught my eye that I'm very interested in is the latest news on cyanide capture of fish because it's horrible and it's supposed to be outlawed, but people are still doing it in parts of the world to catch fish. And basically they fill up a bottle of cyanide and they squirt it toward the reef. The fish gets stunned. They can scoop them out more easily. And uh, then the fish typically dies. So it's a terrible practice because it doesn't benefit anyone other than the guy that caught it. And I heard they get paid nickels and dimes for what they do. You know, let's say they get 25 cents a fish. So you catch, you know, 10 fish with some cyanide and you made yourself a buck 50. It's just, it's crazy. So um, I really do want to see that practice stopped. And I'm very interested here on the latest information on that. Uh, someone a year ago or two years ago came out with a uh, medicated bath that you could put a fish in to verify it had been caught in cyanide, but they were only able to do it with one species of fish and no one else was able, in other labs, was able to recreate those exact conditions with success. So I'm looking forward to this talk. <clears throat> and, you know, if you're interested in that or any other topic, whether it's lighting or flow or uh, controllers or, you know, you name it, there's going to be something that you can definitely tune in for and, and you'll get to really enjoy it. And I know you can't all go. I get it. I mean, this is an international audience and there's a big chance that many of you are not going to fly to America to go to this event. And I understand that. And so the good news is typically uh, Bulk Reef Supply uh, is a sponsor for all the videos and they share all of those videos a few weeks after Mac now, or they trickle them out, depends on their schedule. And they'll release all the content so you can actually watch those talks from the comfort of your home. But that is not what I recommend to the average Joe. I suggest that you go to Macna and learn and interact and, and buy things. And you know, it's just, it's so fun. I mean, why would I go for 17 years in a row if it wasn't fun? You know, I, I'm not going there to sell things. I don't run a booth. So it's really about meeting other people, talking, networking, learning, and uh, you know, coming home with some cool toys. So I highly recommend that to you guys. Uh, the Virginia said I would go if it ever came to Houston. Well, it was in Houston in 2006. Where were you? <laughs> uh, it's all over the U.S. You know, it bounces around. Uh, last year, was it Vegas? And then, you know, there was a year before, a couple years before that was San Diego. It's been in Iowa. It's been in Florida several times. Uh, it's been here in Texas uh, several times. Uh, it was in Dallas, a couple, uh, Dallas once, Fort Worth once, Houston once. Um, trying to think what other locations. I've been, wherever they were, I just went. You know, I just booked a flight and I rented a room and I enjoyed the conference. And so I, I really do recommend it because the amount of money you'll spend on that trip might seem like a lot. Let's just say it's $800. And you're like, well, that's $800. You know, like, I know. But you guys are looking at a little frag of something. You're like, 250 sounds fair. <laughs> and that frag may die. So getting the education that'll help you keep your frags alive is far more valuable than to just keep buying corals and hoping for the best. So I really do recommend that you try to make plans and for $20 a day and $10 parking, that's nothing. I mean, that's great. I, I'm sure I paid $180 for my Macna ticket last uh, fall. So, but I'm doing the whole thing. It includes my banquet on Saturday night. It includes all the speakers and includes the vendor hall. Uh, so, that's my spiel. See, it wasn't a long one today. Aren't you proud of me? <laughs> Reef and Dive says this. I love this. Bring it to Brazil. <laughs> I love it. Uh, let's uh, do that, and then we can all go to Brazil. I think that would be fun. All righty. Um, now... Today is water test Saturday, and water testing is so important, and I talk about it every week, and I don't know if you guys all obey me. I wish you would. <laughs> but I really want to encourage you to test your tank today. I've got my test kits right here. A lot of times people ask me, what do you use? So I use the Elos Calcium Test Kit, the Elos Alkalinity Test Kit, the Elos Nitrate Test Kit. Well, that plus I use the uh, API one as well. I also use magnesium by Elos and phosphate by Elos. I'm a big fan of Elos, uh, so that works out. And then for checking salinity, I've been using this probe, which is super convenient. And I've been doing it, um, there's a couple ways you can measure it. I mean, you can just take off the, the cover, turn it on, 
stick it in the tank and hold it until the number stabilizes. And that works, but I always worry, what if there's something in the water like stray voltage that's affecting it? You know, what if something's leaking power? So I always like to take a scoop of water out of the tank and set this in a glass and measure and verify the numbers are the same to make sure there's no weird interference going on in my aquarium. And that's a good way to keep things safe. I'm still using my magnetic stirrer that I did a video about so many years ago. Um, I think it's Aquaristic SK or something like that. It sells one that's very similar to this one that you can buy. Um, I think it's even available on Amazon, but it's a magnetic stirrer, stirrer. This one was 3D printed by a friend of mine in China, and he sent it to me, and it's been well used. And, the, and you put your beaker in here, and you put your little bead inside, and it'll spin and it mixes the solution. So I'm not doing this with a vial because I hate doing that. <laughs> so I definitely recommend that you get all your testing done today, see your results, um, share them with us so we can see how you're doing. And uh, there's a couple places you can share them. You can share them on uh, Instagram, which is where we all started the Water Test Saturday uh, routine. And it's real simple. You just write them down on a piece of paper, take a picture and post that on Instagram. Make sure your account is public so we can see it. And then hashtag post your results, hashtag water testing. And uh, tag me, at Mila's Reef. I would love that. If you don't want to do that, we also have this option of coming to Club Milo's Reef and posting right there on Facebook. And this group is over 5,000 people in it. Uh, every, you know, the moderators and I, we always talk. And I remember someone said this a couple of months ago and it was pretty funny and I, I saved it to memory, but I never used it. But like I said, we're over 5,000 members. And I said, it's been a good week. We haven't banned 4,999 people today. <laughs> but we, we, we've actually very rarely had to ban anyone. Uh, a couple of people have had to show the door because they just were too argumentative for the group. Um, but for the most part, everyone's really nice in there, and I, I love that. So you're welcome to join the group. I approve it. Uh, I was out of town, as you might remember. I went to Comic-Con last week. And so I would, I still have to catch up on getting everyone else approved that joined, or that requested this week. So I'll do that later today. And in that same group, you can also post pictures of your tank. You can ask questions. You can say, what is this thing? We don't mind. You know, we're, we're happy to help you figure out what's going on with your tank or just to enjoy what you share with us. Uh, some of you have YouTube channels or you shot a video and put it on YouTube and you can link that in Club Nose Reef to show us your tank so we can check it out, which is even nicer than pictures, right? All right. Um, I want to kind of change topics. So let me turn this thing off so it's not on your screen forever. Um, I, want to, I want to talk about no-pox. I want to talk about everything. <laughs> so I am at the end of my rope with no-pox. I have been dosing now for, I believe, five months. And I am just sick of the slime. Uh, I, I told you guys a few weeks ago that, uh, you know, I contacted Red Sea directly to ask for their, their advice, their thoughts, their opinions. And they basically said, you're on the tail end of it, you'll be fine. Well, I do not agree. I am not fine at all. There's this weird slime that continues to grow in my overflow box, in my refugium, it's all in the plants. Uh, it's inside the sump area. And I mean, there's ways to catch it, which I'm, okay, another thing I'm gonna be doing this weekend, I'm installing the clerisy. So that can probably catch a lot of this garbage. But like I said, it's on all the surfaces. So the inside of my overflow box has this wispy stuff just like dangling off the glass. It's not loose to where I can catch it in a sock unless I swipe it off. And so what I like to do is kill the flow in the tank, wipe those things out with a sponge and then go on with my life. And I'm sick of cleaning it up. And I have cleaned it out four times now and in five months. <laughs> and so, you know, I'm just, I think I'm gonna stop. I think I'm gonna do something different. Um, and I've had multiple conversations with people that said, well, what are your nitrates? What do you care? And you know, what were your nitrates before? How was your tank? And I was like, they were really high. They were like 50. And that is pretty high. Um, it's not really high. Really high is 180. But, uh, you know, 50 is high. And most corals like to be under 10, if possible. And so people said, but your reef is so pretty. Your corals are so healthy. Why are you worrying about it? And the only reason was because I wanted to add more fish. And when you add more fish, you have to feed even more. And if my nitrates are already 50 before I add more fish, it's only going to get higher. So I needed a way to get them down. And I was really hoping 
I would come across something that would just keep them down and keep, you know, keep them down permanently. So there's uh, been other things that have been recommended to me over the last few months. Uh, algae turf scrubber keeps coming up, uh, vodka dosing, uh, the uh, methanol stuff that there's a company in Florida that makes this box that does this kind of, uh, well, it's a methanol dosing system that doses into the water, the water ferments and removes all the nitrate and then that water drains in your sump and it refills the new water and eventually after it's done this flushing cycle, I don't know, 50 times, you suddenly start seeing low nitrates because every time it drump, dumps water back into your system, it's nitrate free. So, I don't know. I, um, and then of course there's the other option, which is crazy talk, and that's to do a bunch of water changes. But who knows, maybe that'll be my route, I don't know. I would really like to put this slime stuff behind me. It's so annoying. And uh, it, you know, it just, you look in there and you're like, ew. <laughs> So that is not a full review of the product. I mean, obviously I am going to have to do a, sp a specific one that shows what I did, how I did it. Um, so anyone following along could then decide if that's for them. And, so, and the funny thing is there's people out there say, yeah, I've never had that problem at all. And I'm like, well, I do. So um, I've also got some unboxing videos I'm about to shoot this weekend. I have a lot to do this weekend. And uh, after I've got all that done, I get back to editing. <laughs> so I, uh, while I was in California, in San Diego, I filmed a really pretty reef tank. Uh, Tapio is part of our Club Milos Reef Group, and he has a beautiful SPS reef. It's a couple years old. And so I, I got to swing by his house one evening and film it for an hour. And so I'm looking forward to sharing that with you guys. All right, what's my next one? Um, oh, the refugium light turned on. We should switch. So now you can see it turned on. I feel like I'm gonna like to have this light a little bit lower so I don't see the reflection off the acrylic rim of the sump. See, that looks better. It's not as blinding. Uh, so that's where I'm at right now. Uh, I have to say, the difference between this light and the one I've had for nine years is this light is less bright to my eyeball. I haven't measured anything yet par wise, but it just seems weaker. And I'm wondering if I have to get two of them to get the amount of oomph that I would like to really grow macroalgae. So we will see. Okay, Derek asked a question. We're gonna start answering questions, guys. TDS in my RO meter starts climbing after about 50 gallons. Is that normal? No, actually it's not. Um, he says we run on a, on a well and uh, it's out in the country. Do you have any ideas? Well, what we need to find out is why the number is going up at all. It should stay down and I guess I need specific numbers. So here are the things I'm going to always ask you. I'm gonna ask you, what is the uh, TDS of your well water? Uh, what is the TDS of your RO water? And then what is the TDS of your DI water? And from making 50 gallons of water, your TDS should not go up on, at all. As a matter of fact, it should be up really quick and then come down in that first two minutes, which is why I always say to burn off the first two minutes of RO water before you make DI water. And then I would then expect the number to stay nice and low for the entire duration and even get slightly lower and lower and lower the longer it runs. Because RO DI systems work best when they're worked hard and long versus to have them turn on and off multiple times a day, which some people do and I strongly discourage. It's just not smart. All right, let's see what he said. Since I'm answering his questions, we will do the follow-up. So it goes from zero to about five after 40 and then shoots up. Went from 55 to 120 in 30 minutes. Okay, let me ask you this. When you did that, did you measure the water in the barrel or were you actually seeing the number being measured from what's in the tubing? Are you measuring it in the tubing or are you scooping it out of the barrel and sticking in a TDS meter and seeing the number go up? And while I'm waiting for that, Daniel, I'm so glad you and your wife are coming. I hope you love MACNA. Um, have you been before? And if you have, tell people why you like going. And if this is your first time, that's great too because everyone has a first time. I think Derek is still typing. Okay. Uh, Sensei Brewster says, 
this is my first Mac. Now, what are the top three things you must do? The first thing I would do is, you know, once you've checked in and you've got your, your schedule, which by the way, there's an app you can download and the schedule will be populated on the app as well. And you can go through all the titles of all the talks and decide which ones you absolutely want to hear. And that way you don't miss it. You're not like, oh, I didn't know they were doing it at two. I would have gone, you know? So find out the schedule and pick those topics you like, circle them with a Sharpie or whatever you got to do. <laughs> don't do it on your phone. <laughs> and then once you've got your, uh, your, your mapped out events, then you can plan the rest of your trip around other things. So when you're not listening to speakers, you can definitely hang out in a vendor's hall. And I like to go up and down every aisle and see every single booth, no matter what. And I take my time. I don't rush through it. I, it's not a, a race because it's a three day event. And I will work my way booth after booth to see what they have, why they have it, what can it do to make my life better? Or, um, or if it's just weirdly curious, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. Cool. And I just go to the next one. So you'll have lots of opportunities to find all kinds of cool things to see. And then the third thing I would say is uh, hang out in the evening with all the hobbyists. So whether they're, it's the reception on Friday night, um, going down to the bar in the hotel, uh, maybe there's a group outside by the pool, just get involved in conversations with other people. Don't be shy. You know, just kind of walk up and introduce yourself and tell them about your tank. That's a great way to start a conversation with almost anyone. And then once you've accomplished that, then, uh, you know, you'll just learn through osmosis or ideas will come up in your head or questions and you just have these great conversations with people. And, you know, it, it doesn't have to always be about aquariums. You know, a lot of us talk about everything. And, you know, I'm going to get a lot of people asking, what was Comic-Con like? And what was your favorite part? You know, that's all going to happen because, you know, my friends have been watching me go for so long that they, <laughs> now they, they tune into my Facebook to get the latest pictures. Alrighty, uh, Derek replied. The TDS meter is integrated into the system, measures in three different spots, supply, you know, the source water, the DI, and then the clean RODI water. Um, typically we fill the entire 45 gallon trash can for a long period. Perfect, okay, that's good. Um, okay, so what do you need to measure is the RO water, not the RODI water. And you want to know what that is the entire time the unit is running. You want to see what's happening with that number. Now, when it comes to well water, it is a ch there is a chance, and it's a real thing, that you have CO2 in that water. And CO2 tends to destroy DI resin. So the, the workaround is kind of a big complicated thing you have to do, but it'll save you a lot of money in the long run. So basically, you're going to collect all the RODI water, RO water into a barrel, and then you're gonna run a PVC pipe, like a three inch pipe down into the barrel and snake an air line down there with an air stone, like a wooden air stone. And you just wanna um, oxygenate it. Hang on guys, someone is at my front door. Audio. Um, so once you've got your barrel of oxygenated RO water, you're going to use a, a uh, what is the term? It's a certain type of pump, permeate pump, to move the water out of the RO barrel, through the DI, and into the DI barrel. And by doing this, your DI is going to last much, much longer, and you're going to save money. But the thing is, you have to have two vessels of water. You know, the RO water that you have to oxygenate to drive off the CO2. And then you pump that water into the DI cartridge. And then it passes through into a DI barrel, which keeps sealed and cleaned and covered. And that way you'll have nice, clean DI water. So perhaps that is the problem you're encountering is that CO2 is in the water and it's affecting your readings and going up. But I, I would go back to just looking at the RO water all the time, not RODI. And I, I'm not sure if you're able to do that with your inline meter or not. But if you are, great. You know, so that way you can kind of track this down and see if it makes a difference. All right. Uh, Debbie says, Quantum Marine USA makes a nitrate reducer that doesn't make slime. <laughs> that sounds perfect. I'm going to buy a few barrels of the stuff.
<laughs> yeah, uh, actually, the guest at the door was a couple guys trying to sell me pest control. They said, well, you have spiders in the neighborhood. I was like, yeah, I do. But uh, he goes, you ever hire pest control? I said, I'm on a live stream right now. I can't talk. He's like, I can do it for next to nothing. I'm like, well, do it for nothing. <laughs> um, Derek, I'm back to you again. If your RO water is measuring 140 to 150 coming out of the RO system, your membrane is shot. That number is much, much too high. Um, even if your TDS, I mean, think about this. The rejection rate of a 100 gallon a day membrane is 98%. So for every 100 TDS, you have two TDS come out of the membrane. So for you to have 150, you'd be having to, you'd have to have source water that's like 2,000 TDS or something like that, or even higher. And your number should be much, much lower. You, you want it to be under 20 coming out of the RO, and then the DI polishes off the last. If it's coming out at 120, 150, it is gonna burn up that DI resin, like you said, every 45 gallons. It's not gonna last at all. So you're losing money. Lance, thank you for the super chat. I appreciate that. Uh, are you going to Aquashella, Chicago? I actually am. I'm gonna be there. Uh, there's a lot of YouTubers are gonna be there. So this is your chance to attend and hang out with the people that you like to watch on YouTube. And I get to see some of my friends as well, which will be fun. Uh, I don't have any specific uh, plans for this event. You know, I'm not speaking that I'm aware of unless they change their mind and tell me they need me to speak. But yeah, I will definitely be there. I've had people ask me also, are you going to Reefapalooza, California? I don't know. Um, I have MACNA coming up at the end of, this, uh, the end of next month. It feels like this month because it's in 30 days roughly. But uh, that's coming up very soon. I don't know if I'll make a trip to California first. Uh, I haven't decided. Yes, I can definitely do that. Pontus, I'm just wondering if you could give us some good tips on keeping our temperatures down in our tanks now that it's summer. Here in Sweden, we have been getting up to the 90 degree range or 32 Celsius. Yeah, that's pretty hot. You want to keep your tank under uh, 85. As soon as you hit 85 and above, the oxygen level is dropping in the tank and the fish start to suffer because they can't breathe properly. So we definitely want to make sure the tank doesn't go over 85. If you have a small tank, a medium-sized tank, uh, you can use ice to cool it in a pinch. Uh, one of the tricks that I learned a long time ago is to take like 20, you know, if it's a small tank, let's say it's a 12 gallon or you know, even a 20 gallon, you can freeze 20 ounce bottles. Fill it up with RO water, not quite to the top, put the cap on there, put it in your freezer, and you have this frozen brick that you can then float in the tank and it will give off coolness and help the temperature not get too high in the tank. That is an inexpensive way to do it. And if you have multiple bottles in the freezer, you can then you know, take one out that's melted and put a new frozen one in. And usually you want them during the heat of the day. You're not gonna do a day and night. It's not like an ongoing forever thing. It's just during the day, it gets so warm. So that is one inexpensive method that works. And for bigger tanks, we can use a two liter bottle <laughs> and you can freeze that. Uh, others have actually taken bags of ice and put that in there in an emergency. Again, these are like worst case scenarios. But for normal cooling, my preference is a cooling fan. So I have these fans on my sump. I will show you right here. I just installed recently. So these three fans right here come on based on the temperature of the water in the aquarium. And when the tank gets up to 79.5, the heater, I mean the uh, apex will then trigger on all three of these fans and they'll all come on and they all blow down on the water. And so it's helping cool the tank rather than just letting the tank get warmer and warmer. And just putting these fans on here um, reduced my own tank's temperature by one solid degree. So it, it really helped. Oh my goodness. He says, don't get excited. I'm gonna get excited anyway. Reef and Dive, thank you very much for the super chat. That was a big one. Um, I do appreciate that. And, uh, you know, I really do want to continue to give you guys good information. So thank you for that donation. That's awesome. Um, if you uh, don't have the ability or, you know, you don't have room or you can't do the fans, then the next obvious choice is going to be to, com to, to commit to a chiller. And a chiller is like an air conditioner unit for water. And water pumps into it and then comes out of it colder. And it's always doing a closed loop on the aquarium 
And so as water passes through, the chiller cycles on and off to keep the tank temperature right at the temperature you prefer. And when you see Tapio's video, you'll be surprised at the temperature on his chiller. <laughs> I know I was. But uh, chiller, one thing you need to know about chiller, it's a thing that's about as big, a, huh, it's about big around as one of those covered litter boxes for a cat. And it can make some sound. It can pump a lot of heat out the back, which will warm up the room you're in. At the same time, you're, um, you're trying to cool your tank and the room's getting hotter and hotter. <laughs> so that's one of the reasons I don't like a chiller myself because I don't want to add heat to my house. So I prefer to keep my entire house nice and comfortable. My air conditioner runs all the time. And uh, I mean, <laughs> all the time. And even today, it's funny too, because I don't know what's going on with me, but lately I'm either cold or hot all the time. I guess I'm going through the change. But uh, I, all morning I'm freezing to death. I'm like, God, why is it so cold? Why is it so cold? And I'm just, <laughs> and then I start getting ready for the live stream. I'm like, oh my God, I'm so hot. Ah. <laughs> and it's just like, all right, I don't know what's going on. But uh, maybe it's because sitting and watching TV lets me get too cold. I don't know. Maybe I have to keep on the move and, you know, be an adult. <laughs> But uh, yeah, a chiller is an... Now, here's something I need to know. A couple things about chillers. Number one, you got to clean a chiller on a regular basis. And I'm not really talking about the inside. I, I never hear anyone talk about cleaning the inside of a chiller, like, you know, going through the, where the water passes through it. They're talking about the intake screen, like on the front of a in-wall or in-window air conditioner unit. You know, you pull off the plastic cover and there's like a screen in there. You have to remove it and rinse it out or, or blow it out and then put it back in. Or even you have to swap it out with a new clean one. With chillers, they have the same situation where you have to clean it to keep the coil from getting obstructed with all the dust and all the crap gets sucked in. And because we're near a saltwater tank, you could even have salt damage, and you'll see it. I mean, it'll just over time, the aluminum will get more and more damaged on the, uh, the chiller portion of the unit. So that's the first thing. You have to keep cleaning it. And a lot of people don't think about that. I mean, they literally don't. And they're like, hey, my chiller stopped. And, you know, they bring it to someone to repair it. And the first thing they do is pull out the screen that you can't even see through. So make sure you're cleaning the chiller uh, screen. And then the second thing that you absolutely must do is you need to find out how many gallons per hour the company that made that chiller recommends pass through it. Uh, I'd say on average, it's 400 to 500 gallons an hour. So that is more than a maxi jet. So you need more juice than that. Make sure that you're getting the rated amount of water passing through it. If it's going to through it too slowly or if it's going through too quickly, you're not going to get the results that you're expecting and it's going to be all over the place or it's not going to be effective at all. So make sure you're following the directions very carefully on flow rate through your chiller. You're going to always have to make sure that your circulation pump that's feeding water to the chiller is operational and that's going to require you to know. I mean, there's going to have to be some way of looking at it or putting your hand in front of it to make sure that water is moving through it and back into the tank. So maybe you have a pump in the sump, the pump goes into the chiller, the chiller then goes up to the tank with an output nozzle and you can see the surface rippling so you know it's flowing. For example, it would be a dedicated line. That's one way. Um, if you're going out of the sump into the chiller and back into the sump, like at the other end, uh, you can do that, but you won't have any way of knowing if it's doing its job or if it's got a problem unless you're sticking your hand in the water and feeling on the suction side or on the output side. So it's something you have to keep an eye on. And, uh, but I mean, obviously if your tank temperature is exactly where you want it, it's doing a great job. But if the tank temperature starts to wander or isn't cooperating, something has happened and it's time to inspect. And it's gonna be flow through the chiller. It's gonna be the chiller finally needs to be repaired because they don't last forever, they do break. Or it could just be it's obstructed with dirt. So those are, that's pretty much the ways of doing it. Cooling fans, chillers, keep the house the right temperature. <laughs> and when I say the right temperature, the temperature keeps the, the house cool so the tank doesn't have to get hot. That would be it. Um, yeah, so Pontus was saying, what's the maximum temp? Eight, once you hit 85, your tank is gonna start to decline a little bit. Now you can overcome it by adding an air stone to add bubbles into the display itself, and that will help in a pinch. But we definitely wanna keep it under that temperature if at all possible. Keep it down, keep it, you know, I'd say 84 should be your max, and keep it under that as much as you can. All right. Um, I feel like I missed something here. I 
Adam asks, any idea why the water coming out of my DI resin is at 15 TDS for the first 30 seconds and then one minute before dropping off? Yes, I, I kind of feel like I know what's happening. I think what you've got happening in your aquarium is, I'm sorry, in your RODI system is that when you first turn it on, you just turn it on and water starts moving through it. And all the water sitting around the membrane then goes through the DI. And that first 90 seconds, the TDS goes really high, like 100, 200, 300. It can go up a lot. I and mean, it comes down really fast too, like the stock market. So you want to, you don't want that water, that initial burst of 100, 200, 300 to even go in the DI. So you want to put a T fitting before the DI and run some tubing. And this is your purge line. And you are just going to open the valve, wait 90 seconds. I mean, I literally just, I take my watch and I go, hey Siri, Set timer, two minutes. Okay, two minutes and counting. And then she counts down and I walk away. And I'll tell you, I mean, even yesterday, I forgot that I turned it on and I'm in the fish room looking at the slime, <laughs> getting annoyed. And then my wrist starts vibrating. And it's like, oh, I gotta turn off the purge line and start making RODI water because I have now burned off the TDS creep. So I think what's happening is you're getting a really high number. It's going into your DI. It's so freaking high. The DI can't even tolerate it. And then it finally comes down to a lower number and now the TDS is zero coming out continuously. So I would split it off before that uh, DI section and purge 90 seconds to two minutes. That usually is more than enough. And you can measure it with a meter and see what's happening. And that way you can see for yourself how quickly the numbers go up and down. And I have a video on this channel called Avoid TDS Creep. So just go into Google, type Avoid TDS Creep Milev and you will find my video. Um, okay, back to the other topic. We talked about cooling. If you are using fans to cool, yes, you're going to have to add more top-off water, but I would think most of you have an automatic top-off system connected to your reef setup, so that way you don't have to replenish it manually. Uh, top-off water is very inexpensive, and it is uh, very easy to add, and uh, I don't know why anyone even worries about that one. Uh, that It seems like I hear people say, oh, but, you know, I've got to add more water. Like, so? I mean, <laughs> I don't know. It's like, I'm doing laundry. Oh no, I have to use a little bit more Tide in my wash. It's like, okay, so I just put a little bit more and I do it. You know, it's just, there's times when you need more. And in, there are times a year when your tank's in a very little evaporation. There's times where it has a lot of evaporation. And especially if you're using cooling fans, it's gonna be more. But if you've got a big vessel of RODI water near your sump and it's automatically topping off, it just means you're refilling it one day sooner than you're used to maybe. Lance, congratulations. I'm really glad to hear you're going to Aquashella and Arifa Palooza. That's awesome. I think you're going to get twice as much of the fun stuff. Hey, Siri saying I'm done. <laughs> that was two minutes, people. No, great. I'm glad you're going. Um, enjoy yourself. Explore. Look at everything. Ask a lot of questions. Don't be timid. Um, but don't be mean. <laughs> I don't want people to sit there and say, Mark said don't be timid, so I'm being really aggressive today. Um, Mode, I guess that's how you say your name, says, I'm seeing a red type of dust showing up on the sand bed after dosing with reef uh, biofuel. That could be hints of cyanobacteria. Um, and uh, you just don't want that to get out of control. Perhaps you need to dose less of that product or talk to them directly to see what they have to say. Any advice on trying an SPS nano tank? Oh uh, yeah, Brett, uh, it's definitely doable and a lot of people love doing that. Uh, the smaller nanos have a very small body of water and a lot can change very quickly. Uh, evaporation changes salinity very quickly and uh, temperature can cook these little tanks really fast. So if you can keep salinity stable and temperature stable, then it's just a matter of dosing with alkaline calcium magnesium, uh, doing the occasional water change, and having nice flow in the tank and of course good lighting. And if you can do all that, yeah, you can have an SPS reef. You can have a little tiny one. And one of the videos that I've got uh, pending to release with you guys is a beautiful 12 gallon SPS reef. And uh, you guys are gonna love it. I, I was just, I walked in, I was like, oh my God, this is so beautiful. And I was really impressed with him. Uh, Kelly says, she's running a calcium reactor, I believe. 
She said, I started dripping my effluent into a small container and put a small air stone in there, and the pH went up from 6.0 to 7.8 as it's dripping back in. pH is really stabilized. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, that is one way of getting the, uh, to help your pH in your tank. Like for example, with my tank, my, ever since I had a new pH probe installed and calibrated, my number has been lower. It's, uh, it used to be like 8.1 to 8.3 every day, and now it's 7.9 to 8.1. And that doesn't really, I, I don't care. I mean, that number just, it's still within the target range. We love 8.3 as the high, but if you can't have it, you can't. If I were to remove my calcium reactor, I'd probably be 8.1 to 8.3. Usually, a calcium reactor is effluent, that low pH coming out of the reactor, will affect a tank's pH by about 0.2. So if you're at 7.9, with a reactor, then without it, you'd be at 8.1. And then as the lights come on, it goes 8.2 and then 8.3, and then the lights turn off and it starts dropping again. So yeah, using an air stone to drive up the pH in there, nothing wrong with that. It's not gonna affect, you're not seeing any kind of precipitation or anything with your effluent, so I think that you'll be fine. Another method of uh, overcoming that, I've seen it, I've never done it. And it was kind of one of those things that caught my eyes, like, huh, never thought of that. So the calcium reactor media, that's in the reactor, you can use more of that in a secondary cylinder. And you can have your effluent drip through all that media and that'll raise the pH and then it comes out at a higher pH. And there's no air stone, there's, there's nothing that you have to do mechanically other than hook it up. And the one that caught my eye was the guy had a Coca-Cola bottle that he filled up with reactor media and he stood it in a sump and he drilled a small hole in the bottom. So as it trickled in and worked its way down, you know, like a pachinko machine, if you know what that is, it would come out the bottom and it helped bring his pH up a little bit higher. I've never worried about it and my pH has always been whatever it is. And like I said, right now it's been measuring 7.9 to 8.1. And I never put fresh air in this house. Matter of fact, when I was at Comic-Con, I stayed with a friend and they had no air conditioner and we had to live with open windows. And it was weird for me to have fresh air around the clock. I'm amazed I didn't come home sick as a dog because uh, uh, the weather was cold and then warm and you know, then I'm breathing in God knows what all night. Fresh air, what is this stuff? <laughs> um, yeah, Terry, uh, that was 120 seconds. I, I, I've been doing two minutes for a long time. 90 seconds is fine, I just don't tell her 90 seconds, I say two minutes. Virginia, you need to get an ATO for your reef. And I know a guy that sells them. Matter of fact, I'll put this on the screen. Milasreef.com sells top-off systems and the Smart ATO uh, Micro is a great top-off kit. And I, I've been using it on my frag system for three years and I haven't had to replace it yet. And I definitely recommend it. So if you could get that, it would make your life a lot nicer. So I do recommend that one to you. Thank you. I saw this shirt and I was like, I've got to get this because it reminded me of the periodic table and we're always talking about sciencey stuff and it's, it's sodium on them. And then, you know, the na 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 and then Batman. I was like, this is great. I got to get it. So that was one of the shirts I got at Comic-Con. <laughs> um, Mr. Russell, I think that's what that stands for, says, do you worry about acclimating lighting when introducing new SPS? I actually don't. I uh, no, Notoriously, whenever I put a new frag in my tank, I put it right down here on the sand. So it's very far away from the lights, and so I don't have to worry about acclimating. You know, they're just, wherever they came out of, odds are they were in a trough this deep or this deep or this deep, and it had some really intense lighting over it, and it just was growing, and then they sold it, and I bought it. Because uh, people have frag tanks, or they have uh, frag troughs. And so then, I have a tank that's 30 inches tall, so if I put it way down here, I'm around the 24 inch mark, that seems to work out just fine. And then after a week or so, I can move it up a little bit higher or you know, a couple weeks later, I can glue it wherever I like it. And I haven't had any uh, ugly surprises other than one neighbor killing another neighbor. But no, I don't have like a brand new coral, put it in my tank and it just bleach or something like that. That doesn't happen. Uh, this one I'm gonna stick on the screen. I haven't heard of this one. Reading about rip cleaning of a reef tank. When algae is spotted, it consists of pulling out all the rocks and corals and fish and cleaning the rocks and replacing the sand bed. Wow, why? Why would I do any of that? No, that sounds horrible. I, that sounds like a reset. 
and I would never want to do a reset on a reef tank unless I absolutely had to. Even when I had acreating flatworms, I didn't do a reset. I just tackled the problem exactly where it was in the tank and handled it. So I'm definitely going to say that that's uh, um, something I would not do. Uh, if you know, if I am going to do a complete reset on the frag tank, it's just garbage. It's been horrible. It's got clownfish, anemones, leather corals, um, and then all the pests. And I just want to completely change the tank, change the plumbing, change the drain system. I'd like to put a new sump under there. And uh, I want to uh, put all the rock in the back of the tank and then put a actual frag rack in the front to start putting corals on, hook up a calcium reactor to it and calcium reactor to it, and then let it just be awesome like my reef. <laughs> and then I can take frags out of here and I can put them on plugs. And if somebody comes by and says, I want to buy a frag, like here are the choices. And I think that would be super nice to do. And it's on my hit list of things to do, hopefully before Macna. Kelly, did I call you a girl? I apologize. I, I don't even know what I said, but obviously I said the wrong thing. <laughs> I can't tell. That's all right. Let me put it this way. My name is Mark and Everywhere I go through a drive-through or I uh, talk on the phone, they say, can I speak to the man of the house? <laughs> or what else would you like, ma'am? I hear that all the time. It's just my voice is at that octave, apparently. And Lance, thank you for the super chat. Um, e. Schlicht says, what kind of container are you using? For what? Uh, what are we talking about? Maybe he was answering someone else. Thank you, Adnan. <laughs> Kevin says, my nitrates are back down in the 80s. Yay. Wow. Okay, keep going. Don't get too excited yet. You want to go even lower. <laughs> 80s. <laughs> um, Todd says, do you not chase your pH to the point you don't even know what it is? Uh, my apex measures the pH all the time and I can just look at it, but I never care about it. It's just not a number that's ever a factor. Uh, only on very rare occasions, something will go wrong. And when I mean rare, I mean out of 21 years, maybe twice this has happened, where the pH shot up really high, like 8.7, 8.9, 9.1. And that was from something overdosing, I believe. And I just had to bring it back down rapidly with some white vinegar. So. Something keep in the back of your mind, find out what you need for your size tank in case the pH gets too high to lower it. And uh, there are articles about it. Randy Holmes Farley wrote a really good one about fixing like Kalkwasser overdose. So you wanna make sure that you can get that pH down if it gets too high. But anything between the 7.9 to 8.3 range is good. There are beautiful reef tanks out there that are 7.7 .7 to 7.9 and you would never know the pH was that low. You'll think, oh, that's a great looking tank. And then they tell you the pH and you're like, what? Just like when people saw my reef and I'm telling my nitrates are 50 and they're like, how is that possible? So uh, I had a friend call me up yesterday and he said, hey, Mark, I want to get into a water exchange program with you. I said, what are you talking about? He said, my tank has no nitrate water and your tank has a bunch of it. I want to hook our two tanks together and you give me the nitrate and I'll give you the zero nitrate. That would be a long run of plumbing, I guarantee you. Adnan, don't worry about that. I appreciate it, though. Let's see. Phil says, I'm setting up a peninsula-style tank that's 48 by 24 by 16 with a 1-inch return and a 1.5-inch drain. Any suggestions for flow? Um, peninsula depends on the thickness of the end of the tank, you know, the, the far end. But I have Vortex on mine. I really like that to send water the, the other direction. And if you do the uh, <clears throat> MP60, it'll be for any size tank, but they're really big. Uh, MP40 is probably more than enough for a, a tank your size. And I, I like it a lot because they're small. And I mean, I've been running Vortex for since 2006 or 2007. So I really do like them because they last forever and they're silent and they uh, move a lot of water and they're not hard to clean. <clears throat> if anything comes up, I can call Ecotech and they will troubleshoot whatever the situation is and we'll get it resolved. Keel asks me, do you use a Neptune Trident? And if so, how do you feel about it? I love it. Uh, I got my Trident a few months ago. I was part of the NSI testing group 
and they sent one out to me, you know, I bought it, and they sent it out to me and I hooked it up and I learned very quickly that I got to become more lazy and yet stay informed. And that's just pretty much the best part of it. So every six hours, it's gonna test the water on the tank and give you the results on your on your app. You can just open up your phone and say, oh, okay, so alkalinity is 9.3 and calcium is 450 and magnesium is 1400, I'm like, okay. And you, it's always updating. So, you know, the next day you get another update. And, you know, I was con I'd check it about three times a day because <laughs> I'd hear the little guy whirring I was like, oh, nice. And then I would, you know, uh, go ahead and uh, wait until pretty much the 30 minute mark. You know, it takes about 20 minutes or so to do all the tests. And then I would watch my results and I was like, okay. And it was great. I didn't have to do anything. It just let me know. I mean, it's very similar to not having one. If you don't have a test kit, uh, I mean, a, a Trident and you have to use a test kit, how does it work? You test the water and then you decide, does my tank need anything? But with this, it's doing it automatically all the time. It lets you jump in and react more quickly than someone that or to only test on Saturday. Uh, Aquamarine says, uh, do you do your own salt? Do I make my own salt water? Yes, I do. And what salt am I using? I still have a lot of Aqua Vitro. Uh, they call it Salinity. That is their brand of salt. And I, I have bought multiple of those giant 55 gallon barrels and each barrel makes something like a thousand gallons of salt water. So I still have probably half a barrel left. Brett says, do you make any all-in-one tanks? Uh, I've only made a couple in my history of working with acrylic. I don't make a lot of tanks at all. I tend to focus on everything underneath, you know, the sumps, the top-off containers, the skimmer stands, uh, brackets, uh, trays to take pictures of your tank from above, like this one right here. This is a top-down tray, and I can just lay my phone in there and take pictures and just let it float on the surface. And I can shoot video or take pictures right through the glass and without any reflections and without any bubbles, and it's great. But uh, yeah, if I had to make a small one, I possibly could. The challenge is always gonna be, you know, you say, well, I want this, I'm like, okay, and then you're gonna wanna put certain gear in there. So I'd have to know what you're trying to put in there because typically a lot of the all-in-ones have little like stacking trays to put in media. Uh, they wanna put a spot for a little tiny skimmer. You gotta get a pump in there. So yeah, it, there's, there's a lot of thought that goes into every single tank. Uh, Vam, I believe that's how we say your name. Uh, he saw a video recently about the custom denitrite, uh, nitrifier boxes. I saw that, yeah, there's a company out in Florida that's making them and uh, that's something I was talking about earlier today you know, in this stream is that it's definitely something that I could possibly consider leaning toward. Um, it seems to be an effective way that works and uh, you just have to make sure it's set up properly so that nothing weird happens like the product leak into your sump somehow. Lance says, do you think you would use a reef bot versus the Trident? Actually, I think the best answer is to get one of each and have your Trident and have your reef bot. And that way the Trident can test alkalinity, calcium, magnesium, and the reef bot can test nitrate, phosphate. Mm, what else? Oh, and then the Apex already reports pH, temperature, and can uh, give you salinity readings. So, I mean, you could pretty much cover almost everything you need with a couple of devices. It just, it's, uh, it's just money. <laughs> it just comes down to how much you want to spend. And I do try not to go crazy on spending money. I try to be reasonable. Oh, news. Okay, back to my website for a second. I'm just bringing this to your attention. Let me scoot over here so I'm not being covered. Um, I just sent in my uh, first order for Neptune Systems products. So you will begin to start seeing things I sell on my website, including the Apex, the auto feeder from Apex, um, the flow sensors, the... Uh, ATK for top off water, uh, not the Trident. <laughs> That's gonna go out to people that have been doing this for a while that sell a lot of product. But I just wanna let you know, I'm gonna start selling it on my website. So if you're looking for Apex products, uh, you can check my site or you can let me know what you want specifically and I will be sure to include that in my next order from them so I can have it in stock or so I can just like get it in and send it to you. So if you wanted to send me some business that way, I'd appreciate it. And I just wanna let you guys know that was about to happen.
do you sell the enzymes you use on your site? Are we talking about Prodibio? Or are we talking about like things like Live Rock Enhance? Um, I'm trying to think of what has enzymes. I know that Live Rock Enhance has enzymes. I don't believe... Uh, uh, <laughs> Why can't I think of the name of that jar right there? Benarif. Uh This one doesn't have enzymes. It's just got a lot of tiny foods in it. Uh, I don't sell Prodibio at this time. It is something that I could possibly start carrying. I just haven't done it yet. And I dose Prodibio on my reef twice a month. I try to aim for around the 5th and the 20th of each month. And uh, sometimes I forget, and I'm a couple days late. All right, Glenn. Uh, would you say introducing small SPS frags is much better instead of SPS mother colonies because smaller pieces are more hardy or resistant and stronger to aquarium changes? Yeah, actually, frags tolerate a lot more, and they're so much prettier than colonies. You know, I mean, I love a, a beautiful colony, but when you get a little frag, you're like, oh, my God, look at the color of that thing. You're like, I've got to buy it, and you, you buy it. And you put it in your tank, and it gets bigger and bigger, and then you start looking at it, you're like, eh, it's kind of brown, or it's kind of blue, or it's kind of red, you know? But it's not the vividness. And there's something about a brand new frag, they just explode with colors, and that's why they're so popular to us. And you could say this about a lot of things, not just SPS. I mean, even with zoanthids, you know, there's a certain look to them, but as you get more and more, they could start to look kind of bland to you after a while. And uh, it's just... It, it seems like brand new tiny things are so much prettier. And plus, it's a lot easier to plant a frag in your tank than it is to plant a colony. Because when you're trying to secure a colony in place, it's usually kind of top heavy. You're trying to get it in there just right. It's taking up a lot of real estate. It's covering all the spots you're hoping for other frags. So it, it is nicer to start with small pieces. But in a tank this size, that's 400 gallons, I don't really enjoy a one inch frag. You know, I want something that's kind of fist size <laughs> that, you know, you can see from three feet away. Because if I can't see it from three feet away, it's kind of pointless. It's like, why did I even put it in the tank? I can't find it. And I was looking down from above from some of the little frags I brought home from Florida. And one is, you know, about this long now. I'm like, all right, it's grown. And it's actually less colorful too. So, and I'm sure it's something to do with my water. But it was just so pretty I had to get it. And, you know... It would have been nice to have kept that intense color. I've had people ask me, hey, how's the Walt Disney doing? And I just took pictures of it the other day. It's, it's nothing special. It's just yellow. I mean, it's, it's just green. So I'll show you guys really quick here if I can find it. <laughs> it's not good. So that is my Walt Disney right now. Let's see if it'll focus. There we go. And it's just green. It's not pretty. Um, now, that was under less than intense blue lighting but it's just kind of iffy you know it's nothing special and the funny thing is i moved it to a better spot with more light and it just turned green so keel asks do you use a dose to feed your calcium reactor and would you recommend it to push or pull water through it i always push water into the reactor i don't pull it through and uh, I'm using the Kamor EXT, which is a continuous duty dosing pump. And that one right there is uh, what I've been running now for, I'd say, about six or seven months, maybe longer. I saw it last year at Mac, and I got super excited. And within a month of getting home, I'd bought it and uh, hooked it up. And I've been running it ever since. And I've got it set up to where it's dosing or sending water into the reactor at about 81 milliliters per minute. <clears throat> Mr. Russell asked a great question. How is, what is the best way to add biodiversity to a tank? Let's get this on there. Um, because by dipping everything, by having dry rock, dry sand, you've got nothing. And everything you put in is sterile other than the life of the animal itself. So yeah, you're gonna have to introduce some bugs somehow. You can buy pods from different companies like Algae Barn, Reef Nutrition. Um, who else is out there? Pod My Reef. These are three companies that come to mind. You can get plants from live-plants.com live out of Florida. And they'll have all these different macroalgaes that are guaranteed to have little bugs in them. And having those little bugs and creatures is actually pretty great. Matter of fact, this was a very interesting conversation I had this week. I had a guy say, hey, Mark, I, um, 
have a reef tank, I think he said it was like 60 or 70 gallons. And he says, and I'm setting up a 20 gallon nano, how many bristle worms should I take out of my big reef and put in the small tank? And I said, you shouldn't have to put any. And he said, well, you know, they're good, they help clean up. And I was thinking, this is the one guy on the planet that agrees with me that bristle worms are not bad. Because everyone's like, oh my God, I hate bristle worms. I don't want bristle worms. I got to get them out. I got to buy a bristle worm trap. And uh, <clears throat> bristle worms are part of the Detrivore kit. They are part of your cleanup crew. They clean up decay, waste, meat. Um, if you have a clam die, they're the first ones to consume what's left. If you have a fish die, they're all over it. And you're like, oh, they killed my fish. I'm like, no, they don't kill living animals. So he was ready to put some in. And I said, well, you're going to somehow introduce them into your tank. You get a brand new frag, you get zoanthids, you get an acan, you get whatever, and invariably something, even dipped, will end up in your tank and you'll have a bristle worm. Uh, and then you'll have 10 and 50 and 100. And he was just saying how it, he was going to move some over. I said, man, you're like the only person I've ever heard that was asking how many to get and, and what's a good amount. So, yeah, don't fear them. They're actually perfectly fine to have. If you have too many, you can add a long-nosed hawkfish or an arrow crab. They both eat them. And they'll only eat what they can reach. So they're going to keep the population under control so they don't get out of control. And they, they do exist based on food. So the more food available, the more you'll have. The less food available, the less you should have. Um, you know, it does kind of, the population is controlled by the, the uh, husbandry of the aquarium. Bye, Reef and Dive. Bluegrass says that after fighting high nitrates forever, his solution was a sulfur denitrifier. And I, yeah, that's actually, I had one in my hands for a while uh, that was lent to me by a friend. She goes, here, you can use this. And so I brought it over here and uh, I tested my water and the nitrates were like zero. I thought, well, why do I need this? And so I never hooked it up and I gave it back. Now I need it, right? <laughs> but yes, that is definitely a viable solution that will work. All Express has a great question for our stream today. Advice for a beginner in the saltwater hobby. The number one thing I want you to do is grow a huge amount of patience. And the second thing I want you to do is read, 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 or watch videos and learn as much as you can before you spend any money at all. Because the more you know before you spend, the more likely you'll spend wisely and you won't have to buy things twice because that is one of the biggest problems people run into is that they say, well, I want to hurry up. I want to set it up. I want to buy this. I want to get it. And they hook it all up and it's okay. And then after a while they learn about some other stuff like, oh, that's so much nicer than what I got. Why did I buy that? And so they will buy a replacement of that item or items. And you end up spending twice as much money because the being in a hurry, which goes back to my be patient, take your time, learn a lot. And, you know, ask questions. Ask people, hey, I'm thinking about buying such and such. What do you think? Read the reviews online. Um, look at people's tanks you really respect and learn what kind of equipment they use. And that way you can say, yeah, I want that stuff. <laughs> That's really working for Steve. I want the same skimmer. I want the same reactor. I love the return pump he chose because it's variable speed or it's DC or whatever it is that you like. But Learning from others is the best way, rather than trying to reinvent the wheel yourself from scratch, which a lot of us had to do in the old days. And now we have such a huge body of people involved that we can get help from each other and, and avoid spending money the wrong way. Nukoba says, nice whitetail. Yeah, I really like that coal. She's got a problem around her face that's been going on for some time, and I think the only solution is going to be to trap her from the reef and stick her in a separate tank and, I don't know, medicate her. And I haven't had the uh, time to tackle that, so she's just kind of enduring. But I'd like to get her taken care of. Island Boy Reefing asks, what do you do to keep such wonderful corals in the aspect of supplements? Well, okay, so my, my method of reef keeping is not complicated. I have a protein skimmer. Actually, I'll show you that again. So right here, let's see if I can get this a little bit lower for you guys. So 
So you've got a protein skimmer right here. I've got a calcium reactor right here. And I have a refugium right here. And then there's a return pump. And that's everything that's in the sump. That's all there is. There's not even a sock or anything like that. And when it comes to supplements, <clears throat> I use Prodibio twice a month, which is BioDigest and Bioptim. Uh, they also have things like <clears throat> IOD Plus and Strontium Plus, and those are to keep your strontium up and your iodine up, and they're really easy to dose as well. You just break the vial, pour it in. I mean, that's it. And so I've been using that since 2011. Um, to maintain phosphates, I use um, Phosphate RX to bring it down. Since dosing NOPOX, I had not had to worry about it, so that's been nice. It's just kind of taking care of it. Um, and uh, I was dosing magnesium when needed. Uh, based on test kit results, I would then hook up a dosing pump and trickle in the magnesium to get my target level, which basically was about a gallon of magnesium once a month that went into my tank. And I did that over a period of a week until the entire bottle was empty, and then it sat empty for three weeks. Uh, the only thing I haven't done in a long time, and I'm not really sure why I haven't other than being lazy, is run carbon. And I haven't had carbon on this tank in forever, and my water is not crystal clear like I like it. Uh, this is kind of misleading. I mean, it looks fine. You know, the video makes it look kind of, I don't know, opaque. It's not. It, it looks right. But when I look at the tank from this end, and I look at the length, it's not crystal clear. And because of that lack of clarity, if I were to run carbon, which takes out a lot of the yellowing of the water, the water will look much better. And then once I hook up that clarity, it'll take out a little particulates blowing around too. And so carbon and clarity are the two things I'm going to be adding this weekend. Uh, like I said, with all the things I'm doing, there's so many things I have to do, and that's another thing I have to do. Alan asks the question, is there any pellets to use in a reactor to control nitrates? Yes, I have a video about bio pellets, and you can run those in conjunction with Microbacter 7, and that is a method that helps reduce nitrates over time. The thing is about those reactors, they take a while. It takes like about four weeks to even kick in. So when you hook it up, you just have to let it kind of percolate in the background and just make sure it's constantly tumbling. You don't want it to be stagnant. You don't want it to clump. You want it to be constantly moving. And uh, then you should start to see the decline of nitrate because of the bio pellets. Eric says, I don't have access to Live Rock Enhance near me. Where are you, Eric Lawrence? Aren't you on planet Earth? <laughs> um, by the way, I do ship that stuff everywhere. I've had people ask me to ship it to the UK, and I've shipped it uh, to Canada. I've shipped it to uh, uh, Belgium so and Luxembourg. So it's gone to a lot of different places. And I just get a quote from the post office what it's going to cost to ship, and you tell me how many jars you want, and that way I can determine how much the box is going to weigh and the, the product value, because they have to know that for customs. And then I can tell you the price. And shipping's around $16 to $24 to get two, you know, $16 to ship one jar, $24 to ship two. And so if you're wanting to do that. But if you don't want to use that and you want to use something else, I'm sure there's something on the market that you could find. Um, Because there are, you're looking for a type of bacteria slash enzyme that will consume waste. And so if you can, you know, Google what you're looking for, odds are 10 companies make it. You know, Fauna Marin probably makes something and they're, they're international. Uh, <clears throat> trying to think of what other brands might be available that might have things. DD Aqua Solutions, they might have it. So... You could talk. You could check their product lines and see what they have to help with consuming waste. But I'm really impressed with Live Rock and Ants. <clears throat> Nukoba says this is a sump you had built. No, this is a sump I built uh, that has a removable sock holder. If you choose to use it, correct. Yes, I uh, made a sock box. It's awesome. I love it. Um, I've hooked, used it a couple of serious times and it caught all kinds of garbage beautifully and quietly. And I did not think that was gonna be possible. I was sure it was gonna do the job, but I thought I'd have to listen to the sound of water going down the emergency drains, like a, a sucking sound. And it turns out I could dial those gate valves exactly right to have all the flow go into that sock and none of the sound. I was so impressed. I mean, I just, I can't even overemphasize how awesome that was. But I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna pull out the sock box. It's sitting over here in the corner right now. 
All right. It's right there. So I'm going to remove that guy right there. And then I will set up the clearancy in that spot. You know, um, I don't understand how this ever became a question. Everyone has been saying, should you push or pull on a calcium reactor? And I don't know where that thought came up with or why that question just keeps coming up. You push water in and then whatever is going in is going to come out the other side. That's how it is. And uh, I, I watched a BRS video and the guy on there said you can pull the water through. He says he preferred that. And I think maybe that's where all where this question got started but you're if you're trickling water into your reactor then whatever you're trickling in is going to trickle out the other side in the old days when i ran my reactor because i've had the same calcium reactor since 2004 in the old days i had a maxi jet hooked up to it and it would just push water in and a maxi jet moves like 295 gallons an hour and it would just be pushing water in but then i had a pinch valve on the output to limit it to a very very slow trickle coming out and that worked fine for a long time. And then eventually I made something called a manifold where you have one pump feeds a, mul a, a series of valves and one of the valves fed my calcium reactor and it pushed water into the reactor. I think that some people are worried that you could push too much water into the reactor and make it explode, <laughs> make it burst a seal, make it leak, I guess. But uh, you just push it in. It's, it's a simple thing. Uh, I don't see how drawing it out makes it work any better. You know, water's got to get into it. So I, my answer always is push water into the calcium reactor. Jay, you're asking the wrong guy. He says, any tips for trimming and keeping coral from growing out of the tank? No, you got to let it grow. And then you, you get Dwayne to come out and cut everything down and close your eyes and try to imagine it didn't happen. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm just... I'm not a big fragger. I like to see corals get bigger and bigger. And so that's why you guys see things in my tank. And I try not to make changes. So as you follow the tank's existence over time, you see the same things in the same place. They just get bigger and larger. And then eventually, you know, I go in and I have to do the big uh, spring cleaning like we did a couple years ago. <clears throat> Jay, you're saying that you're lowering your alkalinity and changing your lighting to reduce the growth of the corals, to not have them grow as quickly? Your problems are so difficult. <laughs> there are people out there that want fast growing corals. Is Live Rock Enhance available in the UK? As far as I know, no one's actually selling it over there yet, but I do ship it there. Mike says, if your calcium reactor is outside of your sump, there's less chance of flooding your house. Well, I had a calcium reactor outside of my sump for, I don't know, nine months. When I first set up the 280 gallon reef, that uh, sump was so big. It was a glass sump, it was super heavy. It took four people to put it under the tank. And it was so tall, there was like this much room above it. I couldn't do anything. I literally could barely get my arm in to pull out macroalgae. You could, the skimmer had to be external. The calcium had to be external. The reactors had to be external. That return pump was external. Everything was external. It was just a horrible glass box. And I replaced it with my own sump that is on my website, um, <clears throat> which uh, worked out great. And while the calcium reactor was outside of my sump, there was one time when it leaked and the water went right under the wall and through the garage and down the driveway. And that was kind of wasteful. And a reactor can leak. Any reactor can leak. So you want to set it up properly. If you have the ability or the room to do it and someone wants to put reactors outside their sump instead of rather than in the water, which, you know, that's it's doable. I like to recommend you put it in a tray that has a hole in the bottom of the tray with a bulkhead that feeds the water back into your sump. So as the reactor is overflowing, it just drains back into the sump and that maintains uh, the same salinity. You don't have extra top of water being dumped into the system trying to make up for what's being lost. It's a nice workaround, but you'd have to have enough vertical space to put the reactor in a tray high enough up that it can drain down into the sump. And you may not have that ability. But pushing with a, 
a dosing pump into a calcium reactor is not going to cause a calcium reactor to leak outside of the sump. When things leak outside the sump, something mechanical failed. It's not that you uh, had some kind of equipment that's super powerful that can destroy seals. Uh, you shouldn't have to worry about that. Man, today is the day of ringing my doorbell. Let me go check and see who that is. <clears throat> be a special day in Texas because first guy came about pest control, this guy came about siding. Everyone's trying to sell me things. I don't know what's going on. Daniel's saying impressive video quality on this audio and the live audio is great too. What are you using? What is this sorcery? <laughs> uh, there's a lot of money on this table at this point. Uh, no, this is not on the 10s. I am actually filming it from an iMac. Um, which I did a video about six, eight months ago when I bought it. And I've got gigabit upload speeds now, so I, I can rip along like 800, 900 MPS up. And uh, I've got good lighting. I'm wearing a wireless microphone. I installed Tweet De or Stream Deck here to push some buttons, which I'm still trying to get comfortable with. And uh, yeah, no, it's the stream's gotten a lot better than what it was in the old days. And it's just, I think my MacBook Pro couldn't keep up. It's uh, not sorcery, <laughs> it's just, I spent a lot of money. And I'm not done. I am actually this close to pulling the trigger on some new lighting. And uh, I'm excited about it, but oh my God, it's a lot of money. <laughs> but I would really love it because right now, I'll show you guys, I'll show you guys what you're missing. <clears throat> Let me remove this from here. So we're gonna grab this loose camera, camera, and uh, we'll switch to this one. All right, so I'm wearing a microphone, which uses a belt pack right here. And then I've got lighting up here and up here to light the work area where you guys are on the stream. And this is my new stream deck that I'm using. And uh, there's my coffee mug. <laughs> so uh, these are some of the things I bought over the last uh, few years. Uh, I've had the lighting for a long time. The lights have to sit on tripod stands and I've got to put them away every time I'm done with the stream and I got to bring them back out. And I really want track lighting on the ceiling with the lights up there and uh, maybe soft boxes and just have it light my work area where it's like permanent. And that way I could just stand in front of it and, and it's like, it's always there. That's what I want to do. And um, I, I'm, like I said, this close to just saying, here's my credit card. All right. Going on vacation for two days. Would it be better to turn the lights off to keep the fish less active and hungry? Hmm. Well, <clears throat> if your lights are on a timer where they just turn on and off automatically and you have corals too and not just fish, I would just say leave the lights the same. If you are physically manually turning them on and off and you don't trust someone that's staying at your house or your apartment or wherever to do this job, then yeah, I would just leave the lights off for a couple of days. But I don't think it's going to change their appetite. I think fish are going to be hungry because that's what, you know, I mean, how often are you hungry? You know, <laughs> can you go a couple of days without food? I know I can't. Good God, every three or four hours, I'm like, I need some more food. So I would say get an auto feeder. And I use auto feeders in all my tanks. This is an old one. That's why it's got tape holding it together. <laughs> this is the Eheim auto feeder. And it's got a little display here that shows the time and when it's gonna dose. Uh, and then like on this one, it's showing at 6.30 p.m., 18.30. It'll, there's two little arrows pointing down. I don't know if you can see those, but that means it's gonna turn this drum two times. It'll, draw, it'll do it for one dump, drop the food in the tank, and then a minute later, it drops another rotation into the tank. And so every day at 6.30, my tank gets a double dose of food. And those auto feeders, they're available at like Petco, PetSmart. They're about <clears throat> 45 bucks, maybe 50. And I discovered um, on Amazon that they have the exact same thing for turtles. And for some reason, the turtle feeder costs less than the fish feeder, and yet they're identical, other than the outside of the box says turtle feeder. 
so you could save a few, you know, like five, six bucks to get one that's made to feed turtles. So I would uh, suggest auto feeder, but don't set it up right before your trip. Set it up a week or two before to actually observe how, to, how it operates, make sure you're happy with it. And then if you are, then yeah, when you're gone, you know your fish are getting some food that day. So that's the answers to your question, I believe. Debbie asks, what are your recommendations for changing the sand in a running reef? I'm frustrated with a small grain oolitic uh, sand blowing around from the gyres. I still need small grain due to the wrasses. Any recommendations? Um, <clears throat> the sand I have in my tank is made by Tropic Eden. It's called Reef Flake, and, or Reef Flakes. And it's a slightly larger grade of sand. On my website, if you type in, uh, if you go to Google and type in DSB Milev, it'll take you right to my article. And the grains of sand I have are very fine, but they're not oolitic. They are up to as large as three millimeters in, in uh, width. So I would suggest that kind of sand in your tank because it's less prone to move. My tank is running with three vortex and the two conductors. And essentially my, stand, my sand bed is staying very stable. It's not moving around a lot. So I would uh, suggest that. But you said, how am I gonna change it in a reef tank? Well, you're gonna have to stop the flow in the tank and you're gonna have to probably use like a sand vac, you know, like a gravel vac to suck sand out, I guess. Or you're gonna have to scoop it out, you know, around your existing reef. It almost sounds like a reset to me. I mean, for if I was trying to replace the sand and I want to get rid of all of it and replace it with something new, I would probably reset the tank. And that means I would take out all the livestock, I would take out all the, the rock, and then I would scoop out all the sand. And it's easier to get sand out of a tank when the water's really low than when the tank is full of water. It's just so much harder to do it that way. But if you don't want to break down your tank, if you want to do it a section at a time, some people have chosen to do one third of the sand bed one week, wait a week, do the next third, and then do the final third on the third week. And they basically scooped out what they didn't like and they poured in new sand at that end. So you could do that if you want, but there's still the chance your rock work is going to shift as you're removing sand. And that could cause kind of a cascading collapse and when that happens you're almost like well why don't I just take everything out and just get this done in an hour it would have been a lot easier so if you can get yourself some really large trash cans you know, it just depends what size your tank is but let's just pretend it's a 55 gallon or it's 120 gallon a couple of those 33 gallon trash cans can hold water rock livestock fish you can just drain the tank clean the tank scoop out all the sand replace the sand um, start adding water then start putting rock back in add more water, then add livestock, and finally put the fish in. And that would be my uh, solution. Mr. Russell, thank you so much for listening to the streams on the uh, on, during your commute. One of the things that uh, I've been teasing about, I haven't pulled the trigger yet, but God, I hope to do it this next in this next month, is go ahead and get these streams also released as a podcast where you can just subscribe easier. So I've got to set up a podcast website again and you know all that that's entailed and i want to get that done and then we can start to get uh, audio but you see like the, in this video we showed quite a few things for you to look at and so this would not be a great one for a podcast because you know it's visual but if i was just rambling on about cyanobacteria sitting at my desk that's a great one for a podcast <laughs> jay says i look skinny you are so wrong i am like 20 pounds up i am definitely needing to come down on the weight Oh, I got to see this one. Joe hated Macna Vegas. Uh, the raffle was rigged since the volunteers were paid in raffle tickets, so they won 90% of the bigger raffles. It is geared more toward the speakers. Uh, yes, Macna is definitely geared more to the speakers. The other part, I don't know. Um, I would say that anything happening in Vegas when it comes to gambling, you got to take out the grain of salt because they probably couldn't do the normal raffle uh, volunteers usually don't get paid. <laughs> That's why they're called volunteers. They're not employees. But there may have been some laws required in Vegas that they had to abide by, especially since we were actually taking, this event took place in a casino on their property. So there may have been certain, because I remember the word raffle, you couldn't even say it. Um, that was like a bad word at Macna Vegas. But I'm sorry you didn't like the event. And uh, I didn't win anything in that raffle either. <laughs> I, I usually spend 100 or 200 on raffle tickets, and I try to win things that I already own. Uh, you know, unless it's something really cool, like, you know, let's say, for example, I don't own the reef bot. Yeah, to win that would be great. But if I can win an extra MP60 
or if I can win an extra, I don't know, <clears throat> a return pump, that way I have a backup for if one fails and I won it instead of having to spend hundreds of dollars. Yeah, that's, that's huge. So I try every year and I very rarely come home with anything great. <laughs> Usually if I come home with something great, it's because I bought it. <clears throat> but yeah, I'm sorry you didn't have a good time with that one. What a bummer. Tattooed Dancer says, can you show how much flow you give your SPS? It's difficult to determine what high flow is. I have good polyp extension on the SPS. Is that enough of an indicator of good flow? Yeah, um, when you're looking at the livestock in your tank, I mean, it's really hard to demonstrate flow. I can't uh, just put a camera there and show movement of water. I can pour something in the tank and you can watch my cloud move through the tank and then the whole tank becomes a cloud, then you can't tell anymore. But for like the first 30 seconds or so, you can see it. Uh, if you wanted, you could use flake food and you could put it in your tank and watch the flakes blow around to kind of see the sense of how they move through the system. But I like to look at the polyps and I want to make sure that there's some kind of activity. I like to see almost like a shuddering of the SPS polyps because they're so small. And so it kind of looks like wind blowing through a field of rye, you know, just like, and if you can see that type of motion and not just polyps just sitting there like this, just wide open without movement, that would uh, be a pretty good indication you got some decent flow. If the flow is too high, you will literally peel the skin off the coral. It'll start to show its skeleton. Um, it, you know, it, the coral will just decline and you've got too much flow and you've got to turn it down. If it's not enough, um, you usually will see other issues arise as well as lack of coral growth. And that could even be, you're running into cyanobacteria problems. You start seeing things growing that you didn't want. You know, the algae start taking hold because there's just not good circulation through the tank. Aquamarine, um, when you're trying to buy from a website for something going to the UK, just contact me directly, tell me exactly what you want to get, and I will then get you the quote. Uh, my website does not do international orders. Joe says, if you want livestock or coral, then go to Reefapalooza. If you want to listen to a lot of speakers and see different equipment, then go to Macna. That's very true. And Reefapalooza originated as a guy doing a frag swap in his backyard. The first Reefapalooza was in California in Mark Trimble's backyard. And it has grown into this monster of an event that takes place three times a year now in different parts of the U.S. And it is literally designed for people to walk in for like five or 10 or 20 bucks and they can walk around for two hours, buy what they want, and they leave. And they got zero education. That is literally what it is. And I'm not putting it on Reefapalooza. That is their model, and that has worked. And Reefapalooza has added some speakers, but usually it's a small room. It holds maybe 40 people. And yet they say five, six, seven thousand 7,000 people went to Reefapalooza. So to hear that 40 people heard to talk about lighting or heard to talk about controllers or heard to talk about quarantine, it's kind of disheartening when you got 7,000 people attending. So... I'm all about the education, which is why I tell people to go to Macna. Terry says, is there a place to get the old Milev and Quicksilver podcast? Those were great. Actually, that's what I wanted to do. On the, uh, when I release the new podcast website, I'm going to grab all our old podcasts from 2006 to 2009 and put them on that site for fresh downloads because they're kind of gone. And they were a lot of fun. And they, they were wacky, zany. And yet the information's still valid. There's nothing we discuss that doesn't still pertain to this day. Uh, obviously there are gonna be things you're gonna hear like, hey, this week at Marine Depot. Well, that's gone. <laughs> that was 10 years ago. But we had fun making intros. We always drank on the show and the longer the show went, the, the more interesting the show got. And uh, we had a lot of fun. And I think that we're gonna, I, I already talked to Evan about this a while back. He has no problem with that. So I'm gonna stick it on the new podcast website and that way you'll have those to go to as well as getting stuff that's coming off of YouTube. And who knows, I might actually record a few standalone podcasts that hit that site as well. All right, uh, guys, we've been at this for an hour and a, uh, hour and a half. So probably need to wrap it up here pretty quickly. Let's see, we'll take a couple more questions. TSG says, I keep getting cyanobloom in my five gallon CPR hang on back refugium, which I keep the light on 24 seven. How can it stop the cyanoblooms? Well, actually, having it happen in your refugium is never a bad thing. It, it just, it kind of just lives there, but it doesn't, if it doesn't get into the main tank, it just doesn't matter. But you're running the light for 24 hours a day. What macroalgae are you growing that requires the light to be on that much? Because you might just 
be able to reduce that lighting period and maybe the cyano situation will take care of itself. I guarantee you the flow through your refugium is very slow and that's why cyano has taken hold. You can definitely scrape it out or scoop it out and it will keep returning, but you can kind of remove most of it and kind of get a reprieve or a few weeks it looks decent. And then it'll start to get that reddish tinge again. Or you can finally just treat the tank with ChemiClean and it will treat the refugium at the same time and then it's kind of gone. And uh, I, I actually am a huge proponent of ChemiClean or Red Cyano RX is the one I saw on my website. They both remove cyano very well. And that way you don't have to even see it for like six, nine months. Cyano does come back, it happens to all of us. It's seasonal. Um, it can happen from nutrients, it can happen from lack of flow, but it can just happen because it's the season and you just have some. So you know, I wouldn't sweat it, just solve it. Alrighty, um, yeah, you're right, Jay. Oh, Joe. There was uh, 30 speakers last year at 30 at Macna 30, and that was their thing. 30 years, 30 speakers. This year is probably gonna have 24 speakers. That's a lot. And uh, so you've got speakers all Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Oh, there's another thing happening at Macna. So and you'd have to sign up right now. Um, the first day of Macna. Macna kind of opens around, I guess, 10:30, 11, 11:30, 12, somewhere in there. It opens on Friday. It doesn't open early, but First thing in the morning, Friday morning, is the Apex Meetup. And I believe this is the fifth year in a row. And it's a huge room. Last year, the room held 400 people in it. And it was packed with people standing in the back. They brought in breakfast for the people that got in early. And everyone else starved, including me, <laughs> because the food was already gone. Uh, but they'll have bagels, they'll have danishes, they have coffee, they have water. And it goes on for about three, three and a half hours. It's a big, long presentation. They usually do a couple of speakers that talk about things Neptune related, you know, like uh, one year they had Dave talk about uh, all his crazy buttons that he did to rig up his entire outdoor reef. And then last year, I believe, was Devin from Reef Dudes. And he did a whole talk about virtual switches. And he did this really cool effect where when the alarm goes off in the apex to tell you there's a problem, Usually that's a notification, or it's an email, or you hear a chime off the display module, but he hooked up some red lights, so his reef would glow red when the alarm was going on, like when the top off was too low, or when the skimmer was full to the top. And so he used that and everyone applauded, they thought that was brilliant. So going to those early morning uh, meetups are really worthwhile. I mean, you get the food, you get to learn some tricks from other people, you get to win stuff because people get raffle tickets. When you sign up early, you get a goodie bag, which the last few years has included a pint glass. Uh, one year there was little shot glasses. Uh, you get the towel, you know, this is Apex on the side, and uh, a t-shirt. So, I mean, it's really a cool thing to go to, but it's first thing in the morning. You got to sign up like right now. You, I mean, I'm not talking about sign up for Macna. I mean, sign up for the meetup. And that'll be Friday the 30th of uh, August. And that way you uh, can get in there. And you, like I said, you gotta be there really early. I usually don't get there early enough. And there's a massive long line and we finally get in and you know, but that's a really cool one to go to, even though it is a big long sales pitch. I mean, you know, it's, it's their show. They get to do what they want. They get to talk about what they want. They paid for it. So uh, you go there, but there's a chance of winning an Apex, winning a Trident, winning a Dose, winning an ATK, you know, whatever. Uh, hats, swag, you know, all kinds of stuff. And that's Friday morning. So uh, to wrap this thing up, Macna this year is going to be Friday, Saturday, Sunday, um, August 30th to September 1st. It's in Orlando, Florida on the Walt Disney Resort. I'm actually arriving two days early before, or three days early, I guess. No, oh, yeah, yeah. I arrive on Tuesday. I'm going to Disney World uh, for the first time in my life. My buddy, uh, said he can get us in there, and I was like, yes, let's do this, because I've never been there. I've only been to Disneyland in California. So I know I don't have enough time to see a lot, but I'll get to see a piece of it, and that'll be nice. And so I'll get to go on Tuesday and Wednesday, maybe Thursday, I don't know. And then uh, Friday, Macna starts, and then I'm in Macna mode all weekend long until I fly home uh, the following Monday. So that'll be another trip where I have to abandon my tank. Hey, I might as well mention to you guys what happened with the tank while I was gone. My normal tank sitter was unavailable, and he uh, went to do a family reunion in Louisiana. So I called Frank at the local fish store and I said, hey, Frank, can you watch my tank? And he said, absolutely. So he did. And uh, that went very smoothly. Uh, there was no surprises. And, you know, Frank doesn't really know my tank. You know, he knows, he knows everything, but he doesn't know my tank. 
And so, you know, we had to talk through a couple of things. But out of the entire trip while I was gone, there was only one day where I had to send him a text. I think it was Sunday. And I said, can you empty the waste collector for my protein skimmer, please? You know, because I'm getting a notification every hour on the hour telling me that the skimmer is full. And so, you know, after, I don't know, two, three hours, I got a little notification saying alarm is off. And I was like, okay, good. And so he had drained it and uh, everything was smooth. You know, he didn't have to do anything, which is nice. You know, he just put food in the tank and one day he had to empty a waste collector. That was some really hard work. <laughs> so. Um, all right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up here. Let's just, let me reiterate. Today is water test Saturday. I want you to test your water. I want you to find out what all your parameters are. If you don't have the Reef Trace app, I'm a partner in it. And so I do recommend it to everyone. I don't get paid. I'm just a partner. Um, but I do want to let you guys know about it. A new update came out uh, just like in the last two days. And uh, I know a new update came out last Monday. The newer one might be for me because I'm always testing to make sure everything's working okay. But I want to let you guys know they've made some changes in how the app looks. And uh, I'll show you a, a quick preview here. I'll hold it up to the camera. So what's the easiest? I'll just do it like this. So this is the new look of the screen. I'm trying to get it close enough to where it focuses. There we go. And you can see underneath, there's all these little icons right here that you can pick. And so I can actually slide this now left and right and pick the actual element I want to look at. And then it'll just show me the results for that one element. And uh, so that's a new thing that's in here. There's some more th changes have been made. Uh, that's cool. They added a little heart over here on the side to choose your favorites. So you can say, I want this parameter and that parameter and that one. They're constantly changing it. They're always adding new things. And uh, half the time I have to say, what did you do now? <laughs> but uh, there's, they've made logging so much simpler now. On the uh, front there, you can see, oh, come on, focus. See, it's focusing on me. That's the problem. Focus here. Oh, well, um, I'll just read it to you. So you got share results, which is easy. Uh, parameter guide, which is designed to give you the actual reef parameters recommended. These are the ones in the ocean. These are the ones I recommend. And then these are the average of all the reef trace users around the world. And then uh, you've also got log and entry, which is to add one item like alkalinity. Here's my reading. I want to stick that in here and save it. Uh, and then quick log lets you put in like all your parameters. If you've already done all your testing and you've jotted down your numbers, now you can add them into the app and they'll get saved in the cloud and you never lose them. And oh, by the way, if you are a Reef Trace user and you haven't done it <clears throat> yet, uh, if you could do a review, that would really help in the App Store. And uh, that way more people know that it's a good app because there's a lot of effort that went into it and it's, it never ends. I had no idea that an app is forever and that you have to, <clears throat> you, know, I, you know, like when I download a game, like Bejeweled Blitz, I play it. And I never really thought there's always guys behind the scenes keeping the game still working. To me, it's more like I bought a game, it's in my phone, now it's mine, and I'll just play it. But, you know, like there's new features. Well, some guy had to design those features and then upload them, get them approved by Apple, get them approved. Well, I guess Android doesn't approve anything. <laughs> they just let you put it up there. And, uh, but once it's approved, then it goes out and everyone can download the new updates and you get new features. And so it's not just spit out, you know, a program like Word where it's just a shell and then you type whatever you want in it. These apps constantly get updated and there's always staff working on them and they need a paycheck. And so, you know, I, I kind of get it a little bit better now. It still kind of blows me away how much effort's involved in keeping an app running smoothly. So I do really like the app. I, the main reason for me as a hobbyist that's been in the hobby this long, I mean, it's great for me to log my data, but I use the LFS map like all the time. Whenever I'm traveling, I open up Reef Trace, I go to LFS locator and it shows anything near me and we pick stores nearby and I get to visit some shops. So uh, super convenient. And uh, that's just a couple of the features. There's like five different things you can do in this app. So I do recommend it. And uh, I, I wouldn't if I didn't like it. So, <laughs> so there you go, sales pitch of the day. Other than that, I hope you guys have a great weekend and uh, we will have another live stream next Saturday. Bye guys.